Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. So my name is Craig McInnes, uh, co-CEO here at MyCaribou. Uh, we have a global platform for building and managing uh, global distribution. So it uh, gives you the ability to build partnerships, 22,000 manufacturers, 22,000 distributors in over 150 countries, as well as manage and collaborate with partners on a global scale. And our last um, piece of this is a foreign exchange, currency hedging, and international payments, um, which is really taking off for us now as uh, distributors in particular, but also manufacturers uh, look to take advantage of much more competitive uh, foreign exchange uh, spot rates as well as hedging and, and payments. Um, let's get started. So i uh, really thrilled to be joined by Nancy and Lauren. Uh, we have done a webinar together previously, um, and I'll mention that in a minute or two here. But let me introduce them to you. Nancy Peters Patterson, pardon me, is president and CEO of Strategy Inc. She's a venture analyst, an immunologist with an MBA and has operational experience leading companies to be acquired by medtech multinationals. Nancy has performed thousands of medtech KOL projects, each with a significant group of identified KOLs in a full range of clinical areas. Next, Lauren Rodriguez, vice president at Strategy Inc. and has over 15 years experience in life science consulting with a focus on essential due diligence to support the commercialization strategies of medical technologies. Lauren has a background in health economics and outcomes research consulting, where she co-authored an article on the cost effectiveness of interventions. Uh, in terms of Strategy Inc., we will put up a link to their website uh, in the chat panel, uh, but Strategy Inc. was founded in 2000, offering life science due diligence, valuation, and market analysis. They have a global focus, including medtech clients from Europe, Israel, Asia, and South America who seek U.S. market entry. Uh, clients include enterprise medtech companies, distributors, VCs, and emerging companies with technologies in all stages of the product life cycle. As I mentioned, this is our second webinar together. I'm thrilled to have Nancy and Lauren back again. The previous webinar we did was uh, focused on KOLs, key opinion leaders, and we're going to put a link in the chat now to the recording of that webinar as well. Um, so Nancy and Lauren, thank you so much for joining me again today. Really excited about today's topic, and I'll pass it over to you to get started. Great. All right. So can you can you hear this, everybody? Absolutely. Sounds great. Cool. So I'd like to begin and say thank you to all participating and the inside story about how value analysis works and how to ensure that your innovation will receive acceptance from value analysis committees. Today, we're going to take you through approximately 30 slides that will detail about what will be asked by value analysis committees, what evidence sources you need, how to prepare, and at the end, the top pitfalls and how to circumvent them. Let's get started. Next slide. As uh, Craig said, we have a full suite of consulting services for essential market analysis. I founded Strategy Inc. in year 2000. And 46% of my business for the last 18 years is international for clients who seek U.S. market entry. Um, I invite you to review this slide in detail when you receive the presentation deck and share with colleagues who are seeking due diligence services. Next slide. This is the overview of the agenda. We're going to cover the value analysis aspects that should drive your efforts to ensure that you will receive an accepted decision. So the next uh, question, the next slide is why value analysis? Why value analysis? Value analysis <clears throat> is a comprehensive evaluation of a technology, device, biologic, or service by a diverse and experienced group of healthcare business professionals to assess the value compared to existing clinical solutions or practices. There's a significant rise in the need for information to receive approval to sell your technology in an institution or have it available from a GPO. 55% of all healthcare facilities report having a value analysis process, while facilities with greater than 1,000 beds, 90%, greater than 90%, have a vigorous value analysis process. You've got to go through it if you want to sell your technology. So let's discuss what happened for you. Your team has been involved in the lengthy development of an innovative technology. The R&D is complete. 
You have completed testing, you have regulatory clearance or approval, and may even have reimbursement. And now the management and investors expects and forecasts revenue at specific levels. Your sales organization presents at several medical institutions seeking approval of your innovation for sale, only to be told that access is denied. You find out now that the facility requires additional financial or comparative evidence so you're in a holding position for at least a few months or even up to a year. Let's learn about the anticipated information that will be requested so the MedTech leadership or the distribution team for innovation can ensure that you will not be in such a place. Next slide. So what do value analysis committees do? What they have basically three functions. And what are those three? Let's see, um, the reviewing operational data to provide financial metrics against which to compare technology. This includes per unit cost comparisons, revenue potential, and reimbursement for procedures performed. They review and compare clinical efficacy data. The overall mantra seeks value-based improved clinical outcomes and the documentation to prove it. Next slide. Who's part of the value analysis committee? We're going to be speaking about value analysis committees or VACs, so we want you to have a good idea of who we're refer referring to in that discussion. Value analysis committee has a consistent multidisciplinary group of six to seven individuals across several species as specialties as shown. Some institutions have more individuals depending on the particular subspecialty. The group is able to review the information presented to validate the technology offering, including safety and efficacy, incremental costs compared to current and emerging offerings and healthcare provider preferences. Clarifying the value analysis process for med device and biotech developers will ensure that you're prepared with the required evidence-based documentation to validate the technology offering, or if you have been blindsided by a denial, insight of how to take direct steps to achieving a solution. Next slide. Physician engagement in value analysis. So what is the percent of physician engagement in the value analysis committees? 57% have strong to moderate physician involvement. This is based on a 2003 survey from GHX, Global Healthcare Exchange, and the Association of uh, healthcare value analysis prof professionals, which really delivers context and weight to what we're saying. So on why this is important to know, let's go to the next slide. What happens when value analysis denial is going to impede revenue? When you present to the value analysis committee and they determine that the data presented does not sufficiently pro prove the value of the technology compared to the current product offerings. The technology developer or the distributor receives the dreaded denial that states that their innovation does not meet the value guidelines to existing technology in current use at that facility or GPO, and therefore your innovation cannot be included for sale at their institution. You can't go on the formula, formulary. In the redacted example on the lower left-hand corner of this slide, you see the VAC, what they mentioned for remediation was required. They don't always tell you, but in this case they did. Comparative economic benefits, landscape review, and a documented physician-based trial is what this particular institution was looking for for this particular technology. If this happens, it's time to secure help from a consultant to see what steps can most expeditiously rectify the solution. Great. Um, so on, on this slide, we have a general overview of the value analysis process based on the described processes at a range of facilities. Um, however, it's been said if you've seen one value analysis program, you've seen one value analysis program. 
So I want to keep in mind that there will be some variability around the nuances of this process between healthcare facilities and GPOs. Um, what we've outlined here is a four-stage process from the request for a product evaluation to negotiations and contracting. The timeline is estimated to take around 90 to 100 days, um, 120 days. However, um, this will vary based on the frequency of VAC is meeting, which could be weekly, biweekly, monthly, quarterly, et cetera. Um, the number of products they have in the queue for review, if a device trial is required, that could add another four to 12 weeks. And then if additional data is requested during the VAC in that stage three, you'll see that it will prompt a return to that gathered data stage and a return to the queue for review once the data is identified, and that can extend the process further. And then in the next several slides, we'll dive into the specifics of each of these stages and how you can prepare as a vendor to more effectively navigate through the stages of this process. So move on. Great. So in this first stage, the requesting a technology evaluation can happen in a number of ways. Um, there are a few critical points that will aid at this stage. Um, while we're primarily we're going to focus on new product requests throughout this process, a request can be initiated for new or existing products, um, as existing products with expiring contracts will also undergo review. Most new product evaluations are requested by a physician. Um, other request sources can include nurse or service line leadership, supply chain, or in some cases, a sales rep. That's much less common, and that partnership also still usually happens with a physician champion. Um, it is the burden of the requester to identify the need or the problem solved by the new product and to clarify how the current practice is not meeting needs. So this is your first step in the request, to clearly outline the need or problem solved. Many VACs will not consider a technology review without a well-defined need, or they'll just struggle to justify the value of the technology that doesn't so solve a real problem. And then secondly, as most new product, evalu uh, new product evaluations are requested by a physician, um, identifying and building relationships or partnerships with leading physicians at target facilities early is an important step in this stage. Um, physicians will naturally be inclined to initiate a request for a technology they desire to use. Um, and then also with enough prior experience and exposure to your technology, you may, be able, you may be able to forego a formal tech trial if the physician is able to speak sufficiently to the functionality of your device um, and that it works as claimed. And lastly, support the physician champion as they initiate the request. Um, as a vendor, you can also supply uh, contact supply chain sourcing managers to request an evaluation, but this is far less common. Okay, move on. Great. Um, so in the gathering evidence step, the value analysis committee will work to gather all available and required evidence to answer questions that might arise in the evidence review. VACs will often work with the vendor to make sure they have all the required evidence. So this is a good opportunity to provide any and all prepared materials, data, and evidence to support acceptance of your product at that facility. Um, your ability to present clear and organized evidence of the technology value compared to current offerings and established competitors will help expedite this step, but also um, it'll ensure your technology's advantages are being accurately portrayed and considered. The more information you provide, the more control you have over the narrative, so you'll know that they aren't lacking any vital insights. And keep in mind the evidence required here, um, regulatory documentation, tech trial, current practice patterns, health and economic outcomes measures, and we'll dive deeper into what each of these types of questions and documentation will be considered in the next slides. Great. So as I mentioned, VACs will gather data to answer a number of questions. Um, here we've organized the types of questions asked into 10 categories. I'll give you an idea of some of those questions that have been shared with us by VAC members, and you'll notice many of them are comparative in nature. So they're comparing um, the technology and review against the current products being used. And I'm just going to fly through a quick list here. So in patient outcomes, um, what are the clinical outcomes differences such as uh, effect on hospital length of stay? What impact does it have on patient recovery? And we're going to um, expand on common outcomes measures later with some examples. Quality of care, which includes patient safety. So how does it affect complications, readmission or redo rates? What's the patient's disposition after discharge? Clinical and technical could include how the, does the technology work as claimed? How does it work compared to current tech? What are the efficacy outcomes? How does it affect procedure times or current practice? Evidence, are there peer-reviewed validated claims? Is there substantiated evidence for one product compared to others? And we'll get more into what types of evidence hold higher validity as well. 
um, current use, how many comparable devices are used each year, what departments or clinicians are using it or would use the new tech, does it expand department or potential applications, in competitive, what is the vendor landscape, what is the market share for all vendors used, financial, what is the price point and how does it compare to alternatives, what are the comparative cost effectiveness, how is reimbursement structured, in regulatory, is it FDA approved or cleared, do you have a copy of the required FDA documentation, Supply chain, has the company had recalls or problems with any of their product lines? Is a manufacturer prepared to scale up? Um, how stable is manufacturing history? And lastly, contracting. Does the vendor have a contract with our GPO? Do we have existing contracts with this vendor? And does this vendor minimize vendor and product variations? Um, so you'll see value analysis communities, they really get into the details of, um, of the product and how it would impact their um, process and their hospitals. Move on. So VACs uh, use a number of data sources to establish um, claims and comparative value and to answer those questions I just listed. So here's a few on the clinical side, um, department specific clinical requirements, including current practice needs, expected areas of use and current outcomes, evidence based peer reviewed published literature documenting clinical efficacy, safety, health economics outcomes claims benchmarking data, and these are typically from internal sources or records. Sometimes the GPOs will also track current use data. Um, KOLs, providing opinions of technology review, clinical needs and outcomes. Clinical guidelines documentation that outlines policies, institution procedure and clinical guideline from internal leadership, professional associations, and regulatory bodies. And on the next slide, we have... Um, some other common data sources, financial contracting, supplier capacity, product specifications with current and projected product utilization, and reimbursement information. And you'll note a lot of these data sources align directly with the specific types of questions being asked. Um, not all of these are data sources that as a new vendor you'd necessarily have access to, such as contracting history or benchmarking data around current use or department requirements. Um, you can do some homework in the areas. You can also focus on providing strong supporting evidence using many of these other data sources, such as peer-reviewed publications, KOLs, and reimbursement. Um, moving on. Next here we have, um, so this is a list of common outcomes measures that can be used to demonstrate quantifiable value and benefit of a new technology. Um, this list is neither exhaustive or disease uh, procedure specific, but just given as an example to demonstrate the range of areas where value can be demonstrated. Additionally, we recommend further identifying outcomes specific to your target clinical applications as those will carry a lot of weight. We can move on. Great. So we're at the third stage. Um, this is where the value analysis committee, or um, sometimes you'll see a value analysis team, the names are interchangeable. Um, but they'll review all the assembled evidence and consider the comparative clinical cost effectiveness, um, clinical and cost effectiveness of the requested technology and how these decisions are made by institutions varies. So it could be a vote. It could be an internal scoring system that's used. It could be a team discussion and then the final decisions made by a value analysis leadership. Some institutions decisions are still heavily influenced by physician champions. So our, our recommendation to the vendor is to keep in mind um, that as much as possible, understand the specific process at each institution, and then continue to, ve to develop your strategy and materials with each review so that your value analysis package continues to strengthen with and for every opportunity. We can move on to the next slide. Um, so we've included here, and we won't spend a ton of time, but this is an example of a um, decision tool or part of a decision tool. Um, this is from, uh, this is a value analysis review checklist that we've captured from Premier, which is a leading GPO. We can move on. So some of this is going to sound redundant or be redundant, but um, here are some of the specific financial and clinical factors that will drive a value analysis decision based on um, primary research that we performed a few years ago. So this is stuff that was told to us by value analysis committees. And to touch on a few new ones, revenue potential, training costs and total cost of care, the clinical side of things, measurable short-term quality improvements, hospital sa staff safety also factor into value analysis decisions. We can go on. All right. So also from that primary research we did in 2020 um, in a Strategy Inc. survey of value analysis professionals, 
Clinical evidence was described as the top factor driving value analysis decision making, which aligns well with the 2023 GHX Association of Healthcare Value Analysis Professionals survey, where reportedly uh, more than half of value analysis professionals rely on unbiased clinical evidence. So considering this early into your value analysis strategy will allow time to incorporate the appropriate clinical evidence into your delivered materials. So the next slide is about negotiations and contracting. Now you've received the coveted VAC approval. Now we're saying you, they said yes. And the negotiations and contracting begins with pricing discussions with hospital supply chain leadership and GPO management. Hospital supply chain leadership are incented to procure VAC approved products and services for the lowest possible price. However, the benefits of setting up longer term partnerships with vendors motivates fair negotiations. To strengthen negotiations, product developers should have detailed information on competitor pricing to set expectations, volume based discounting, stocking requirements shipping cost payments, lead times for product delivery, product shelf life, storage requirements, etc. You need to have completed your homework to secure the best pricing and longer term contracts. Tiered pricing contracts are determined based on volume levels and commitment. Contracting with top GPOs can open several sales pathways at once. <clears throat> Recent financial trends in pricing include something called gain sharing, which is not often discussed, to incent physicians to reduce inpatient costs. Hospitals can award a percent of the realized savings over the prior year to participating physicians, cash to the docs, and the hospital management. The objective is to improve patient care while lowering cost. This discussion is to emphasize how important overall costs are for new products. A vendor needs to be able to communicate the overall value. Next slide. So how do GPOs engage with value-based purchasing? As you know, GPOs do not purchase products themselves, but instead negotiate contracts with manufacturers and distributors that hospitals or healthcare providers can choose to use when purchasing products. The GPOs deliver 10 to 18% savings across the board for healthcare facilities through negotiated discounts from manufacturers and distributors. 97% of medical facilities, hospitals belong to at least one GPO and many belong to multiple. <clears throat> In 2023, the top five GPOs in the U.S. covered 91% of the total number of staffed beds. Visient, the largest GPO, covers nearly 40% and represents nearly $110 billion in annual revenue. That's a 2021 data point. The total three GPOs account, the top ones, account for 80% of the top 10 hospital staffed beds. You really need to understand what's going on with the GPOs and be sure to present your information to them for value analysis review. The robust value analysis process should be initiated simultaneously with outreach to institutions, so you do them in parallel. The GPO's value analysis is structured to assure all safety outcomes and risks are reviewed. Most GPO contracts for vendor pricing use three-year terms and negotiate dual sources for or multi-source vendors. Member healthcare facilities pay on average a 3% membership fee to the GPO and some pay outcome fees for some products. On the other side, manufacturers pay administrative fees of 1% to 4% of their sales volumes to be sold by a GPO after they have passed the value analysis process for inclusion. It's a complex process, but it's an important one to be involved in. Getting in with a GPO could be a strategic for a new or smaller company, giving you access to a number of hospitals that have existing contracts with those GPOs. Next slide. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> the value analysis comparison for the technology developer or manufacturer versus the distributor. How does it differ? Well, develop the main differences are the range of data that is required for distributors who cover large geographic regions. For example, there can be significant difference how medicine is practiced in southern Germany versus northern Germany that has overarch control. Understanding the care trends in the different regions should drive data collection. It's important to understand cost data for distributors in different locations. In the U.S., costs are usually more related to facility size and more standardized throughout the U.S. For KOLs in the U.S., they are usually more hospital system centric. However, for distributors, they are more regional. Next slide. So how does, how does our strategy Inc. support value analysis? To ensure that you're planning for value analysis, we've outlined the different processes where my company or another could assist your, with your efforts. This will show what you need to organize to be prepared. We'll review these five points and complete the webinar with the top four pitfalls for value analysis committee review and how to avoid them. Next slide. The economic story of cost saving opportunities. Strategy can assist you build an academic story, an economic story to value and document the financial advantages of your target population. It's critical to include operational advantages with the patient or the procedure population and document how the value will be captured using evidence based outcomes. Delivering reference data along with quick read graphic representation to clarify how your innovation is preferred with the included efficacy. Show, do not tell how the value is realized. Process improvements are often key in calculating value. This is an example of a laparoscopic surgical instrument outlining the comparative indications for use and shows in the upper right quadrant what two clinical indications have robustly adopted the technology. This was used by a VAC review. Next slide is the evidence strategy. You've been shown the range of evidence that is both required by Value Analysis Committee and GPO to drive clinical and economic claims. When you have the highest level evidence, patient outcomes from multiple clinical trials or randomized trials, this will support your claims of safety and efficacy and outcomes. Alternatively, you can use peer-reviewed professional studies are welcomed by value analysis committees. You will best be managing your budget by structuring these studies to validate your claims and weave them into your clinical studies. It's no longer sufficient to only include physicians, even champion physicians, to analyze your data. You need to include healthcare administrators, supply chain leaders, financial and nursing leadership, and their commitment to the value of your innovation. The overarching question that needs to be addressed with the review is how does the technology improve patient outcomes and reduce the overall cost of care? Next slide. As mentioned, the value analysis committees prefer quick read graphic representation to clarify how and why your innovation is preferred with the included efficacy. Using physician preference studies in addition to peer-reviewed clinical studies is a method to document the value of your innovation and can be effective, especially for a new innovation. This technique requires you to document the clinicians who contributed by their name, location, and experience just on a slide. One should include the significant or a page if in your value brief. What should in be included is the significant majority of key opinion leaders, along with selected general physicians. You don't want all key opinion leaders. You can see by this multi-layer donut chart, the documented physician preferences for a surgical innovation. It was well received by the VAC. Next slide. In landscape analysis, 
is a comparative overview of all innovations that compete with your technology or breakthrough. The VAC is focused on all the full user experience, including comparative benefits, pricing, indications for use, outcomes for all target indications, and more. It's critical to deliver the unique value proposition, including expanded target users with expanded features. How can your technology be used? It is important to include both direct and indirect competitive information. The example shown is one aspect of an infectious testing instrument targeted to outpatient facilities where space and features and capabilities were important to the decision. Again, well received by the VAC review. Next slide. Lastly, the reimbursement analysis. Understanding reimbursement is critical for value analysis and messaging. You need to confirm the current or potential coverage and payment. The VAC needs to understand the facility reimbursement and for some innovations used in inpatient procedures that offer a substantial clinical improvement, there is a new technology add-on payment that is possible for DRG. This is something that's not well known, and if you have a technology that offers substantial clinical improvement, it's something that needs to be looked in so you can figure out how much the new technology add-on payment is possible, many thousands of dollars usually. You will need to present physician reimbursement codes, and if the innovation is used in an outpatient setting, you will need those codes and the coverage and payment amounts. This table shows an example of cardiovascular codes for 2022, and you can see the variation in payment amounts on procedure complexity. Of course, the DRG is the total amount re reimbursed to the facility. It's important to confirm the reimbursement eligibility within the current coverage as part of the VAP, uh, VAC submission. And finally, we're going to go over what are the top four pitfalls for VAC presentations. Lauren. Great. So I'm going to dive into these four um, common pitfalls and then overview some of the strategies for success to focus on instead. So we can move right along to the first one. So pitfall number one, relying solely on a physician champion. Uh, this was a very popular strategy for a long time, and it used to be that physician would request a device, and, and that was that. Um, it was the strategy to build relationships with these physician champions to bring new technology into a healthcare facility. But nowadays, so post-healthcare reform and that shift towards value-based purchasing, these physician champions are still important. And as I mentioned earlier, they're a big part of initiating that value analysis review. As Nancy mentioned, they're a significant part of the value analysis committee. Um, however, they're not the only deciding factor. So we've outlined some benefits in partnering with physician champions. They do have significant influence in the process and purchasing patterns, especially clinical specialty um, specific physicians are more influential in their own department specific purchasing decisions. And then we've also outlined some of the limitations of focusing solely on um, your strategy solely on a physician champion. And the point I want to make here is the most effective value analysis strategy includes a physician champion partnership, um, but also incorporates all of those other elements that we've been discussing. So understanding and leveraging well the comparative benefits against what's being currently used, having strong objective evidence of clinical efficacy and improved patient outcomes, and a substantiated economic story. And then we can move on to the second pitfall. So not developing a value analysis strategy early. And the, and the value of early planning is the ability to develop the required materials and strong evidence parallel to bringing your technology to market. It prevents arriving to the commercial stage unprepared for key components of a value analysis review. There's also opportunity to identify several of the outcomes measures that will likely drive adoption and build those into clinical studies as secondary endpoints. Early planners are more likely to avoid having to return to that gather evidence stage or risk denial because their value analysis package is more substantial. Um, a lot of elements of a value analysis strategy that we've listed here um, take time to develop. So clinical trial planning, ongoing campaigns, including podium presentations at target meetings, publishing, and then taking the time to research and prepare the individual value analysis programs and requirements. So the goal of early planning 
is to prevent mid-process delays or rejections, but also to be fully prepared to step into the value analysis review process as your technology enters commercialization, not three, six, or 12 months later. And our third pitfall is ignoring the competitive landscape. So I think most medical device manufacturers and developers, distributors, you all have a strong grasp of the competitive landscape for your product offerings. However, uh, many do not give it sufficient weight in their value analysis strategy. So a value, a value analysis committee um, will base decisions compared to the standard of care and what technologies are already in place at their institution. So this needs to be a key consideration when developing your value analysis materials. The competitive landscape should not be taken for granted. And in fact, uh, it can be used to build a case for the value of your technology. We've included here several points of comparison, clinical, economic, operational, and something we've found that I've seen um, is instances where companies invested in understanding the competitors in detail and unlock some niche opportunities of competitive advantage as market entry points. So both in targeting very specific uh, applications where current technologies were lacking, or less safe or effective, or um, also by identifying a very specific feature set where higher adoption trajectory was anticipated based on the competitive capabilities. And our fourth pitfall, our last pitfall that we're gonna discuss today is under preparing for scalable supply chain. Um, so for many institutions, concerns around supply chain are heightened following uh, the supply chain challenges that resulted from the COVID pandemic. And then also there's a cost saving effort. Uh, many facilities are keeping lower inventory than they once did. In a GHX survey of 400 nurses, physicians, service line leaders, and supply chain administrators, more than half could recall a time when a physician did not have the product required for a patient's procedure. So I think it goes without saying that this is a significant disruption of care for a clinician to not have the required medical supplies and a significant risk for a healthcare facility to not have the appropriate supplies available. For smaller companies and newer market entrants, um, it will be necessary to anticipate these concerns and approach value analysis with evidence or a strategy for scalable supply and an infrastructure in place to navigate things like natural disasters. Um, for companies outside of the U.S., manufacturing or storage facility locations might be something to consider. Um, some institutions prioritize suppliers that are closer to their care delivery sites to help mitigate the risk of supply disruptions. And then lastly, we're going to um, move on to these five summary strategies for success. And these are things we've been touching on, I think, throughout this presentation. The first is to understand the audience. It's not only clinical or only business. Value analysis materials should speak both to audiences and consider both perspectives. Um, they should also address clinical needs as well as the business needs. Um, secondly, educate instead of sell. Value analysis materials should use language that informs and educates with a focus on the product and clinical evidence over things like the company's story. Materials should focus on improved outcomes that are built on understanding need to haves versus nice to haves. Focus on outcomes that demonstrate a solution to that identified problem or meet the need that the other devices don't. Fourth, confirm technology advantages first with data. Evidence-based decision-making means documented proof of technology advantages with published literature and reliable sources that will increase the likelihood of a green light. And lastly, build an economic case. Economic outcomes data, reimbursement, and cost savings analyses can all help a new technology to stand out from competitors, even if it's from a long-term perspective. And I think that closes out our discussion today. Excellent. Thank you. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pause sharing the slides for now as we move into the Q&A, um, and then we will do a little wrap-up at the end. Uh, uh, and really, like, the content here is fantastic. Uh, I should have mentioned earlier on, in case you're, uh, you know, taking notes as you go, we are going to share the deck. Uh, Nancy and Lauren were kind enough to do that. Uh, so we'll share the deck afterwards as well as the video. Um, the questions that came in in advance, uh, Nancy and Lauren worked into the presentation, uh, but there are lots of great ones coming in as we speak here. So I'm going to start with the uh, the, the Q and A here, um, and just keep bringing, the, just keep putting them in. If we run out of time, we'll try to answer them afterwards in an email uh, to all the participants here as well. So, okay, the first one is, does the rigor of analysis and substantiating data requirements by the VAC 
depend on the FDA classification of the MedTech product, e.g. class two versus class three device. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if Lauren or I are answering these questions. I can answer that one. Maybe she can take a different one, but um, yes and no. If you have a class three implantable device, um, yes, the VAC is going to be more rigorous because obviously the product is more robust in use within, within patients. However, the data that we've gone over and covered is quite similar for all of them. Um, Class two devices do have uh, requirements for value analysis. Usually the number of people who are involved in the review is less robust than for a class three device. So if you have a class three device, you need to make sure that all of the issues that we've covered today are included. For a class two device, especially one that's been around um, that's been around for quite some time, that particular market segment, um, it may not be, the robustness may not be as significant. So there may be particular features that you're going to be able to offer, specifically cost efficacy, that will really pique the interest and approval of the VAC. I hope that answers the question. Great. I, and I'll leave it to you both who wants to jump in. If you both want to jump in on a question, just go ahead and do it. Um, the next one is, uh, uh, has it been your experience that if a GPO performs a VAC, then all facilities that have access to the contract will accept the VAC decision, or does it typically need to be repeated uh, for, it, for each facility? It's a good question. Yeah. You, see, do you want to answer that? Do you want me to dive Sure. In? I can I can take that one. Um, yes, uh, the VAC, the institutions will have access to it through the GPO if they are a member of that GPO. However, institutions generally want to have their own VAC in addition to what is taking place with the GPO. So that's not the only solution. It is one of the requirements to get the GPO to go through and sanction it through them, but additionally, you are going to be required to go to the different institutions. It does seem to be a convoluted process. Why isn't there just a major, major overarching decision maker that once they say yes, that everybody can go ahead and buy it? doesn't work that way. Hospitals think that they are individual, that their patient populations are individual, and in fact, they may be, and they have that control. Their supply organization has that control, so they're going to want you to go through it as well. Hopefully that's... I yeah, think. Nancy, I have a follow-on to that. Would, would, would it make more sense then to go to a facility first, get buy-in there, and leverage that into the GPO, or you're better off starting with the GPO and try to use that to get into, into facilities? It's a very good question, Craig. What we found to be the most effective is to do them in parallel. Go ahead and pick, say, there are the top 10 um, GPOs covers 94 or 93% of all of the beds uh, in, in the U.S. And there are some outside um outside the U.S. that also have GPOs that they're involved in. And so it's going to be a process. That's going to take you about uh, two to three months before you, when you get started, before a GPO is going to review it. May take them a couple of weeks afterwards. Significantly, conversely, that you can go um, through the different institutions and depending on <clears throat> how wide your sales force is or if you have a, a team that's going to do the uh, VAC analysis prep, or if you use an external organization, you can have several sites that are moving forward. It's not a it's not a process where you have one and then you go to another one. In order to generate the revenue that your um, that your management and your investors are going to be looking for, you're going to need to be doing them in parallel so that you can achieve your approval. Hopefully, that great. answers your question. No, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Sorry. If I may, I do think that um, there is some advantage to being with a GPO that is affiliated to have that approval from a GPO that's affiliated with the hospital you're trying to get into because they like that from a contracting perspective that your product's already on the list with that mm -hmm. GPO that might make the contracting process easier. So that would be something that would be perceived as a positive for the hospital you're trying to um, get your product placed in. Yeah, I was amazed by your stats around uh, just the 
market domination of the GPOs. It's so I spend my time in Canada and the US and it's virtually identical, like north of 80% now um, through through the, the big GPOs. It's incredible. So obviously a key part of the strategy. Okay, next question. Uh, what's the chance of success to go through a VAC for a me too consumable product? So I guess it could be me too or consumable or or both of those things. You want me to do that one, Lauren, or? Sure, I think. Oh. Okay. Yeah, go for it. <clears throat> so it's going to de depend on product use. It's going to depend on the adoption by the use techno the use group, how the nurses feel about it, your biomedical engineers feel about it. But the main issue for a Me Too consumable product is going to be on price. So you're gonna to need to show what the economics are of your particular technology. And there may be some that you know we haven't covered today. How does it work well? How is it being adopted? So yes, it's possible and you're going to be able to go through the VAC, but you're gonna to need to understand the health economics outcomes. Hopefully that covers the answer. Great. Um, okay, let's move on to the next one here. Uh, so this is, have you seen that IDNs have VACs that can apply to all hospitals within the network as opposed to GPOs as noted above? The answer is yes. Um, it's less, um, it's, it's happening less because again, every hospital likes to believe that they have a special institution and they're different and they want you to come and visit them and show you the information. That's their job. Their job is to save money and they get incented. The physicians do, the different hospital administrators do. So they're going to want you to come to their institution. Yes, there are some Kaisers, and there are some larger um, IDNs that have um, a, a group, a technology review committee that may allow it to be used in various institutions, but it's less popular because the, that, that's the job requirement. Uh, supply chain officials and supply chain leadership, they have a 4% or 3% mantra that they have to decrease the cost of particular supplies in a particular area. And so they want you to come to their institution and they want you to show how your technology is going to achieve their objectives. Okay, the next question is around pricing. So um, is pricing not asked for in the VAC process is the question with a comment that I've not gotten to a point where we have an approval without providing pricing. Thoughts on that? Yes, pricing is asked uh, and some, and sometimes you don't know the pricing um, that you want to share globally, you know, if you're going to do it through, for, through an entire GPO, but at an institution, you're certainly welcome. Some people have pricing that differs by the particular institution. There are requirements with that. So yes, the pricing will be asked and you may need to provide that. And it may be something that you want to ask as you negotiate your, your uh, value analysis presentation. Should pricing be included? How much detail? What volume discounts are going to be offered? How do you structure and track the amount of volume? If you have volume as part of your pricing, how is that volume tracked so that you can determine further along what volume pricing that they're going to be achieved. So it will depend on the institution, but yes, it is something that is asked. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, great. Uh, how do you deal with the VAC when the medical device doesn't have a reimbursement code? Okay, so um, hopefully they're, well, they'll be able to um, piggyback on an existing reimbursement code that's out there. And um, when you have the, the uh, codes that are out there, if you're very familiar with the codes for a particular market segment, then you can let them know. Generally, these are covered if it's an inpatient under a DRG, if it's an outpatient or a physician that was paid by a CPT code, you can say that generally the CPT codes for, for procedures such as this are covered with this market range. They're paid between $185 to $240, depending on the region where you are or depending on the region for a distributor. So um, 
If you don't have a reimbursement code, the best thing to do would be to understand what the range of reimbursement is for that particular code so that you could incorporate it so they would know how that particular technology would be covered. Hopefully that answers your question. Great. Keep them coming. The questions are flying in here, so we'll keep going. Uh, what is the cost of getting white papers or clinical validations done? Wow. That's like, how much does it Easy cost question. a house? <laughs> so yeah. it doesn't cost that much, but it's very obviously varied. Um, a white paper getting done is going to depend. If you want us to write a white paper, we've done quite a number of those. Um, you want it to be ghostwritten, and then we can find a target author, uh, clinicians who would like to use the background data, and you know, we'll pull 250 papers and incorporate those into it for clinical evidence, and uh, you, you can pass it off um, the white paper to somebody who is one or one of your KOLs and they can publish it. We can assist them with that. Um, or if it just wants to be an internal publication for a white paper, perhaps you want to publish something on your web on your website or you want to make it available for your sales reps to have, that's a different process. So I think it would be better to discuss individually what you're looking for and we're happy to discuss what the costs would be. Clinical validations um, is something that you're going to have to have, you know, depending on how much of a clinical validation you're going to have, are you going to be doing bench testing, animal testing, human testing? How many do you think you need? 40 patients, 150 patients? So the, the, it's going to vary widely in that. Is on a per patient basis or what are your objectives? It doesn't have to be wildly expensive. You'd be amazed at by doing some kind of a validation study on 40 patients can, can be done. How rapidly that can be done, you obviously have to have institutions that you've been working with and they may adopt and be allow you to do the clinical validations. It's great to have a multi-center, so maybe two centers. And then, you know, put it in, have them, their, their clinical um, specialist be involved at the sites in getting it taken care of. It's something that can be done in, you know, a couple of months. But again, it's, it's, it's hard to say exactly what it would be. And I don't mean to be evasive about this. I invite you to send us an email about what you're looking for. And we're happy to, to give you some what the cost could be. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. We're going to publish uh, Nancy and Lauren's emails on the last slide here at the end. So uh, feel free to reach out to them directly on that. Um, okay, moving along. You mentioned something about new technology add-on payments. Can you clarify and elaborate on that? Yeah, something that we worked with on one of the, at an Israeli client that uh, it has an inpatient uh, procedure. New technology add-on payments are for DRGs. They are for inpatients. Um, inpatient procedure. So say you have a DRG that covers something like, um, I don't know, a cardiology one or an orthopedic one, and it's $12,000 or $18,000 for the particular DRG. If there is a, a particular procedure for a new technology that's going to be used, you need to, again, you'll have some data that you will be required to submit. And those new technology um, payments will last for either two or three years, depending on the area. And they can be in the neighborhood of two to $3,000. So they're very welcome. You need to show that there is significant improvement with your particular technology and how that uh, improvement has been shown. So again, I think it's a, a more lengthy subject, but I think it's something that people don't know um, about as much. And so if you have a technology that really is a significant improvement and expensive, it's not gonna work on a class two me too product. It's gonna have to be something that is a significant advantage. And um, yeah, I'm happy to talk to you or Lauren, we can both talk to you about you know, what that looks like and we can pull in our, some reimbursement people as well and see what that looks like. But it's something that's not very popular and it can be very interesting because the institutions, if they feel like that they can capture that would be great. Um, so, so one of the questions that, well, it's really more comment, but um, it was from somebody who had previously asked a question when we were talking about going to GPO first instead of the, facility, go to the facility instead of advance the GPO. You talked about going on parallel paths. Uh, his comment was that he doesn't go to the GPO first because then he gets stuck with a price uh, afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if you want to comment on that uh, or, or or not either one of you on that. Do you, 
Have you well, found that had, previously? It sounds like he had an experience with it. I think yeah. maybe they didn't have the appropriate documentation to to validate the particular price that they have. So um, I think it's it, I think that would be important to really understand if you are going to go to the GPO and you are going to have pricing information, you need to establish what is the price and what is the value of that price? How does it allow you to treat more patients? How does it allow you to get more rapid release from the hospital, uh, more rapid ambulation? What are the advantages of the particular technology and documenting? There's no doubt about it. Everybody's about saving 2%, 3%. So it is difficult to have a new technology that has a higher price. But if you have the data to prove it, it's something that can be done. So yeah, I'll just mention we're going to, we are going to do a, uh, hopefully a series on uh, GPOs um, in terms of webinars in the future. Mm -hmm. So there's so much we can dig into there. And uh, um, so I'll, we'll, when we get that one together, I'll make sure it gets, um, get sent out to today's participants because there's a lot of kind of overlap here on the GPO side too. So, okay. Um, we're, we're just about out of time, although um, I'll, I'll just try to ask a couple more here. If we uh, looks like we have time for maybe one more, uh, roughly what percentage of products get rejected at the first stage uh, request product evaluation versus after review by VACs. Okay. So again, roughly what percentage of products get rejected at in the, the first stage. stage, yeah. Request the product evaluation versus after review by the VAC, meaning they won't even review. Well, it's going to depend on who do you have. You need a physician champion who is going to be somebody who's going to go to the committee and say, look, we're going to be able to save 12 to 14 percent. We'll be able to do a particular more procedures, et cetera. You're going to have to have somebody speaking for that. Sales rep can be involved in influencing a particular um, clinician in what the issues are and why they think that particular technology is impactful. Um, and then if each institution is going to be different, they may have criteria that you need to show document, send them a form. There are you know, five or six different check marks that you need to go through to show what the value is going to be. Once you've gone through the review, the number of people that get rejected, it all depends on the type of information do you have. Do you have clinical information, clinical data that supports the value of your technology? Health economic data is going to be what allows them to be included at the institution and showing what the value of the technology is. You need to be incorporating this early in your process. Earlier is always, always better and more effective. Hopefully that answers the question. That's perfect. I really appreciate the, uh, the great questions that came in. We didn't get to them all, but we will do our best to answer those in the follow-up email uh, to the audience that attended today and that signed up as well. So I just want to thank uh, Nancy and Lauren. Fantastic topic. Um, really glad you brought this one forward. Uh, a lot of great questions today from the audience. Uh, Nancy and Lauren's contact information are up on the screen now. You should be seeing them. And uh, my contact information as well. So Nancy, Lauren, thank you so much, attendees today. Thank you for joining. I'm gonna stay on just about five minutes. For anyone who's not on our platform and wants to see it, I'll just give you a quick overview. Uh, for those of you that are already on it, um, it's probably redundant, but I wanna thank you all for attending today. Uh, thanks again, Nancy and Lauren, and I'm just gonna switch over to my browser so I can give you a quick view of the platform. Uh, so uh, very quickly, we really do key things here is market data. Uh, finding and managing partners, and then our foreign exchange hedging and payments uh, piece. So I'll just give you a quick overview of those. Uh, this is the market view. Uh, this is my view of the world as a manufacturer in this case, let's say. Uh, green markets are markets that I'm already active in, as you can see here. And purple markets are ones that I've targeted. We cover market data on 105 countries. And our purpose there is really just to inform manufacturers, prepare them a little bit in advance of going to market. So I'm using Brazil as an example here. We cover off uh, over 800 data points now on uh, on each of these markets. So whether it's, you know, you're looking for surgeries by category or uh, types of physicians, surgical specialists, if you want an overview of the regulatory environment, if you want to know about expenditures and financing in that market, that, that's what that's all about. So we do that for 105 countries. We have distributors in 150 countries. And to find them, there's a couple ways to do it. Uh, a simple way is a search. So it is the world's largest set of data around manufacturers, distributors, 
it's also, I believe, the largest in terms of active uh, use by those uh, those companies as well. And what you'll see here then is uh, 44,603 companies. And so if I was looking for distribution partners in a particular country or a particular region, so I'm gonna say distributors, sales agents, and let's do, I just showed you Brazil as an example. So let's use that one. Uh, so that'll take us down to 100, uh, sorry, 1140 distributors in Brazil. And now I wanna further subset it and say, I'm looking for cardiovascular distributors. Um, I could also do things like call points, you know, who do they sell to, um, how long they've been in business, you know, are they full line, are they specialty, are they national, are they regional? In any case, we then give you a profile of the company, a full profile with their website, their LinkedIn page, um, some information about who they sell to, uh, uh, what, what um, product categories, et cetera. And you can then connect with, with um, companies through here as well. This idea of shortlisting here is if you were you know, working on building out a list of potential distributors in Brazil, uh, these are four distributors that I'm, I'm looking at currently, and I can, I can add companies to that shortlist. I could work with my team internally if I need to, to you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, communicate with these potential partners, um, all kinds of things you can do here to eventually find the, the, the right partner in there. The, the second way to find partners, and frankly, the more powerful way, is through what we call opportunity posts. And so what you're seeing here, are these, are, these are live opportunity posts that get matched against your profile. So I'm logged in as my caribou, so I don't really have a, I'm not a manufacturer or a distributor on the platform. If you logged in, it would take your profile, almost like a dating site, and match it with potential opportunities that are out there. So for example, here's a, this is an anonymous uh, posting or opportunity post, I should say. So American made cardiology and diagnostic equipment. They're looking for distributors in the US, Canada, Brazil, Australia, and New Zealand. And so if I was a cardiac, pardon me, cardiology distributor in one of those markets, this would be highly, highly um, ranked in terms of match score. Uh, here's another one, another example. This is a, a seam frame, which is a French manufacturer. And they're looking for distributors in these particular markets, so Asian markets. Here's a description. In some cases, you'll actually see, you know, product fact sheets, uh, uh, information, um, you know, about those particular, uh, about the products that they sell, et cetera. And again, if I'm ready to actually respond to it, the seam frame in this case is going to ask me five questions. So, you know, why would your company be a strong distribution partner? Um, I'm not going to actually do this because it would send them a response. I don't want to do that. Uh, and then, you know, follow on questions to that as well. So opportunity posts uh, can be posted by manufacturers or distributors. Uh, you'll see many examples here. Here's one, J&J uh, &J looking for a distributor in Botswana. Um, trying to see some of the recognizable names I have here where they're looking for. Uh, here's one, Cardinal Health Canada uh, looking for surgical carbon steel blades for Canadian hospitals. Metro Medical is a U.S. distributor. They're looking for surgical mesh suppliers. So these are all opportunity posts and it's uh, part of the part of your access to the platform. Um, very quickly, uh, partner management. Um, I won't actually get into a lot of detail here today, uh, but you do have the ability to manage your partnerships. Maybe I'll do it uh, here. Yeah, so these would be partners in various countries. So in Canada, I've got these distributors. In Germany, I have these distributors. And you can use this as a way to communicate with uh, and coordinate with your, your partners. So you could do it in conjunction with them or just use it as a tool to manage those partnerships. Things like sharing files, sharing conversations about new products, et cetera, uh, can all be done, uh, be done through here. So I'll just show you a very quick example that I could take all of my distributors around the world and I could send them a message. I could take all my distributors around the world or some combination of that and share a file. So maybe I have a new training video, a new fact sheet, a new uh, white paper, a new KOL, it could be any number of things. You drop that in here and it, it will basically go out to any of these that you've you've uh, selected here, all in a couple clicks basically. So tremendous uh, communication tool uh, with, for you and your partners. And it's free for them to be in here with you. Um, you know, they can, they can basically be in here and only see you. They don't get to see any of your other partners or anything like that, but it's a fantastic tool both for managing your distrib distribution partners, but if you're a distributor, it's a great way to manage your suppliers as well. The last thing I'm gonna show you very quickly is our foreign exchange hedging and payment solution. 
Um, this is really a powerful, powerful tool. Uh, it's it's powered by um, our, our partners are Grain, uh, Transformate, and J.P. Morgan. And what we what we realized in the medtech market is that distributors around the world are often selling in one currency. Let's use the Brazil example I mentioned earlier, or Mexico. Let's use Mexico. Uh, so they're selling in pesos in the Mexican um, uh, market. They are sourcing from product products from all over the world and paying for them in USD euros, sometimes pounds, but usually USD or euros. Even if they're sourcing from China, they're probably paying the Chinese manufacturer in, in USD. So what we've actually done is we've, we've created a platform that allows you to save three to 5% on spot rates and even more on hedging. So I'll show you what I mean by this. Let's say I'm a Canadian manufacturer and I need to purchase USD. So I'm going to bring up the rate. This is a live rate. Okay, so I can buy U.S. currency at 1.35934. Now, if I check that against my bank right now, it would beat that by probably three, four, five percent. Even against some of the online uh, foreign exchange tools, we can beat them. You know, a percent, two percent depends on the depends on the currency pair. But it's a, a significant savings if you just do a few million dollars of currency exchange in a year, uh, you're talking 30, 40, $50,000 of savings there alone. The second piece that's so critical with this is we actually also provide hedging opportunities. So we have uh, no collateral, no fee hedging. So what I mean by that is if we need, let's say to go out, I don't know, a couple months, let's say into May and um, USD again in this case, it's going to provide for me a rate at a future date. So I can lock this in knowing, for example, let's say I sell through GPOs and my GPOs take 60 days to pay me. Um, I may want to lock in today's rates or, or competitive rates today uh, so that I don't get burned three months from now by a three or five or 10% currency swing. So it's a really, really powerful tool. And, and you'll see in my case, I'm actually carrying what about six different wallets here, CAD, euros, USD, pounds, Australian dollars, um, and, and the Israeli shekel. So you can have as many wallets as you want. You can move funds between these. You can exchange money. You can lock in those rates. And, and coming very soon is um, the ability to actually pay your suppliers uh, through the platform as well. So if you're a manufacturer, you could actually accept payments from your distributors. If you're a distributor, you could pay your suppliers to the platform. Um, so I, I, I'm going to leave it at that. I just want to reiterate. Uh, markets, uh, data, finding partners, managing partners, and then managing your currency the currency challenges um, in terms of both spot rates and hedging and soon on that payments. Uh, so I really want to thank everyone who stayed on. It looks like uh, quite a few people did. Um, so I appreciate that. And Nancy and Lauren, you stayed as well. Thank you again for being here today. And I want to wish you all a great uh, rest of your week. If you have any questions, please reach out to us. I did provide our contact information. It'll be in the follow-up email as well. And we'll do our best to answer any of those outstanding questions that we missed as well. Thanks, everyone. Have a fantastic day.